All right, I think we will get started. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Will Flanagan. I'm a grad student at the Gladstone Institutes, and I'm also a co-leader of the LGBTQ plus community group here. I will be your moderator for today's event, which we are very excited to be hosting. This Sunday is International Transgender Day of Visibility. This annual event is dedicated to celebrating transgender people and their contributions to society, as well as to raise awareness of discrimination and challenges faced by transgender people worldwide. As a way to celebrate this day, Gladstone aims to provide a platform to trans or non-binary scientists so they can share their work. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Stephanie Miller to take a brief moment to express our respect for the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula, the land on which Gladstone is located. Thank you very much, Will. We would like to acknowledge the Ramatush Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our, respect, our respects to the Ramatush Ohlone elders, past, present, and future, who call this place their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatush Ohlone community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Great, thanks, Steph. So today we have an outstanding speaker with us, uh, Dr. Madeline Deutsch, who is a physician at UCSF. Dr. Deutsch earned her medical degree at Chicago Medical School at Rosalind Franklin University and did her residency at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. She also holds a master's degree in public health from UCLA. Today, she is a primary care physician as well as the director of the UCSF Gender Affirming Health Program, where she specializes in managing gender affirming hormone therapy. Dr. Deutsch is extensively published in research areas, including HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, the use of electronic medical records to capture gender identity and sexual orientation data, and screening for cancer and sexual health risks in transgender populations. Today, she will describe the arc of her career in gender-affirming healthcare, including the launch and growth of the UCSF Gender Affirming Health Program, and she will also touch on critical health system considerations facing the trans community. So as our speaker presents, uh, feel free to add your questions into the Q&A section below. Uh, we will have time after the talk to address your questions. Um, this seminar will also be recorded and auto captioning will be on to help make this more accessible. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome and hand it over to Dr. Deutsch. Thank you, Will. Um, nice to be here. Unfortunately, as you might be able to hear, I'm, uh, I have a cold and um, my voice <clears throat> is questionable dur um, durability right now. So I will do my best. Um, I'm gonna try to speak a little softer. And so if you're having trouble hearing me, let me know and I'll sort of reposition the microphone. Um, so anyway, I, I'm sorry if I'm a little hard to hear and or maybe less than my usual level of enthusiasm. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm, I was actually asked to do this last year, but I think I had an out of town trip planned and I couldn't do it. So um, I was glad to be invited back this year. So I will share my screen. It looks like, um, Will, maybe you need to stop sharing so that I can share. Excellent. So I'll start off by um, just give you a little background of who I am and what my deal is. You heard the bio there, but currently here at UCSF, I'm the medical director for the Gender Affirming Health Program. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit about that. I'm also a professor in the Department of Family Community Medicine. Um, I'm actually trained and board certified in emergency medicine. And um, but my appointment is in family medicine because that's where the most of my work is, is in trans health, which was felt to be a better fit in family medicine. And that department has been a source of great support for this, for this work. Uh, I do also work a couple of days a month in the emergency department at UCSF Parnassus. So what I want to do here is start off by just giving you a little bit of an arc of, you know, how, how did I get here? You know, how did, how did I arrive here? And so you know, I don't know how many other Gen Xers are out there, you know, shout out, but for, for my people, Gen X, this, everybody would know who this is. This is David Byrne from the Talking Heads, and they have this classic song where you may find yourself in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife and ask yourself, how did I get here? 
And sometimes I take a look around at the the job that I have here and I just, I can't believe that I have it. And I say, how did I get here? You know, how did I do this? Um, and it, it's really mind boggling, but I do, after a, a long scratchy climb to where I am, I feel really good about the work that I do. And I'm grateful to be here doing it at UCSF. So this is a picture of me in, I don't know, 2008, maybe 2007. I was working high volume emergency medicine in, in Los Angeles and I was pretty cooked. And I was looking to pivot to maybe um, doing something else with some or all of my time. And you can see there's a huge list of patients to be seen on this screen in the background. And, um, you know, I'm just pretty cooked. So I had a few different ideas. Sorry about that. I'll show you what that is in a second. So I had a few ideas about what can I do. And I had a colleague who worked in the emergency department who was doing these house calls on the side, these like boutique house calls. And I was like, well, I don't want to do boutique house calls, but I want to actually work with my community. And as a trans person, I, I knew that accessing care was very difficult and that there was really sort of a lack of um, any kind of research was very limited and there was just not a lot of access. I was, you know, I, I'm trans myself. I was just prescribing my own hormone therapy because there wasn't anybody to see, you know? So um, that's when I started thinking about, well, maybe what I can do is open up a side practice serving the trans community. I also was thinking about leaving medicine altogether. And so there's a little bit of like a cautionary tale. I came back around to my purpose. So I'm also a musician. You might see some stuff in the background here. At the time I was um, playing in a bunch of bands, um, different instruments, and I actually became so sort of overwhelmed with my initial outlook on, on what a career in medicine was supposed to look like of just kind of high volume in the trenches, emergency medicine. It just wasn't a right fit for me. It was, I felt like I wanted to be doing more. I wanted to work upstream and keep people out of emergency departments. I still liked working in the ER, but I needed more. So back in that time, I was living this dual life. I, I was like a musician. I went to recording engineering school. I had a little recording space. I was trying to start a business doing that too. I was very discombobulated. I was in my mid thirties and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. So um, I was like, well, maybe I should just do this doctor thing on the side and pivot into a full-time music business trials. But I kind of came about my senses and uh, you know, I had tried, I got this business card. I was trying to open up a recording studio. Totally has nothing to do with anything here. Instead, I decided I'm going to open up my own primary uh, um, private practice focused on the needs of the trans community. So, you know, this was in 2006. So like, um, you know, we used to put www for websites, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, I got these business cards made. I got this sort of fly-by-night malpractice policy. And uh, I got a, opened an account with Cedar sinai to get my patients to be able to get their lab tests run there. And I, I wrote my own electronic medical record software using Microsoft Access and set up, my, set up a server in my office. My undergraduate degree is in computer science and engineering. So I had that background. So I set up a server and I built an EMR and a billing system and a calendar system. And I opened up, I got this, this is the building that I rented my space in. It's pretty sketchy. Um, it's in West Hollywood. It's not there anymore. It's been turned into some bougie, you know, sort of modern building with you know, like a juice place in it and everything. But at the time you entered, right, there was a little entrance uh, just out of frame here on the right. And <clears throat> there, there was a DUI school. You see that right there, it says DUI or something. There was a DUI school and um, on one side and a leather shop on the other side. It wasn't that kind of leather shop. It was uh, handbags and belts and things like that. And then I was in a suite where I shared my waiting room with a hypnotherapist and a uh, video editor. I had a really hard time finding a place that would rent space to me. I think they all thought I was kooky. They're like, well, you're an ER doc and you want to do, what is this like? What's trans, you know, trans, they didn't even know, like people, you know, I went to some dermatologist who had advertised they were looking to rent out a, a room in their office in Beverly Hills. And they're like, huh, what are you even talking about? So I, you know, finally found this place and um, 
I was there for probably only about eight or nine months. And it, it was, you know, pretty sort of low rent operation. I bought this stethoscope on, on eBay. I got the, the patient exam table on Craigslist. I had to rent a U-Haul to go pick it up myself. And then I got some day labor to, to help me unload it and move it into the office. Um, and and they, things got really busy. And so within about eight months, I got so busy that I, I, I expanded and I got a second website, the punkrockdoc.com. And I started trying to expand out of just um, trans care into more sort of broader kind of low cost, low frills, kind of outside the box DIY primary care kind of thing. I moved into this fancy building in downtown Los Angeles near where my place was, my, like where I lived. And um, it was kind of a different different level. And I put out an ad in the like the local, like back in those days, you used to actually get like a newspaper out of like a box on the corner. That And that, that's how you would like find out what's going on in town. There was no social, like there was only MySpace back then. So Anyway, so there were like these free newspapers that you would pick up around town and I put an ad in there, but I started to say like, you know, I think maybe I'm getting a little bit of field of what I wanted to do. I'm not super interested in like running a business. I'm really super interested in doing trans healthcare. So this is me probably in 2008, I gave some talk. I think this was up in Seattle at some conference. I was invited to come give a talk. I started giving like local talks and then someone saw me give a talk and was impressed and you know, said, oh, this is somebody who we would want to have give a talk, invite to give a talk at our conference or something. So I wound up, you know, suddenly I'm getting flown up to Seattle and getting a little honorarium even. And so that was exciting. And I said, I think I'm more interested in this moving in this sort of academic direction. I had sort of academic inklings when I finished residency. I went to an academic residency and the job that I took out of residency was at one of our uh, residency rotation sites. It was a community trauma center, but it was it was an academic hospital with a medicine residency, and we had residents. So it was like quasi academic, and I was interested in being quasi academic. So I really wanted to kind of get back on that track. Um, I, I wound up getting invited to be on Anderson Cooper. Um, this was really fun, and this was talking about um, Castro Semania when there was controversy about whether or not she should be allowed to compete because she has higher than natural T levels, whatever that means. So um, that was really exciting. And I feel like since I'm among family here, um, talking to this group, um, he wasn't out as gay yet. This is in 2009. He, he, didn't, he hadn't come out yet, but everybody knew like, and so between like during the commercial break, he like got on the, you know, he was in some other city and I was in San Francisco and their office is here. And he got on the little intercom in my ear and he was like, hey and I was like yeah he was like that was really good and I was like yeah I was like that's right girl so anyway that was that was kind of a cute little anecdote there um so ultimately through this work that I was doing and this sort of um um these lectures that I was giving I actually ultimately got invited by the Los Angeles LGBT Center to begin meeting with a planning group that they had put together to develop a transgender medicine program at that institution. At the time, it was a large HIV clinic and it was the largest LGBT community organization by budget in the world. Um, and they were looking to expand their or offerings to um, provide care to people regardless of HIV status and specifically um, the trans population. And so um, I worked with them for about a year while I continued to run my practice and then we we're ready to launch the program. So we launched the transgender health program and we actually closed my private practice and folded it into the LA LGBT center. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, which was really exciting. Um, it got me out of the private business space that I wasn't super thrilled about um, and moved me into more of an institutional setting where there are you know pros and cons, but it, it gave me the institutional support that I needed to really expand my work, apply for some research funding, which I was awarded. Uh, I got my first couple of publications working there um, and was able to have a, a broader platform from which to do things like lecturing and other academic exploits. So I really enjoyed the four years that I ran that program. And then, and you know, um, just kind of talking about my career arc, as you can see, there was a highly innovative 
high risk, high reward, highly innovative phase early on in my doing this work that was completely private sector. I took on the risk. I, I had to invest all the person hours to develop the EHR. And then I, I wasn't really making a ton of money. It was, it was, it was breaking a slim margin over my expenses to run that private practice, but it was interesting and it was helping me develop a career. I was doing everything. I was doing the billing. I was doing the scheduling. I was answering the phone. I was drawing the blood and putting it in a little box that they come to pick it up. So, um, you know, there's less innovation as you get to bigger and bigger and more established institutions and more institutional support. So it's kind of an interesting thing to deal with the private sector. There's a lot of pros and cons as is the case in the institutional sector. So then when we launched, we had this launch event. But in the midst of this, I got involved with a UCSF program because they saw me give a talk at a conference and asked me to come speak with them about this. And ultimately I joined up onto this um, funded project through the Division of Prevention Science at UCSF, which uh, has, and it's, it's been moved around a little bit, but there is an entity called the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health that primarily focuses on HIV prevention interventions and behavioral level interventions for HIV prevention and engagement in care. Um, it's not a clinical center, it's a prevention, part of prevention science, but um, I was brought in to um, be a, a subject matter expert and capacity building uh, expert on this uh, program in Peru, where we went down and did a bunch of trainings. And this is actually the vice president of Peru, who we met with and talked to her about transgender health needs. And it was kind of cool because at the time, the president of Peru was out of the country. So she, their constitution, when the president is out of the country, they have no power. And so she was the sitting president. And we came in in the middle of her security briefing, and she had like 20 newspapers in front of her. And they told us to wait outside until we, she finished her security briefing. And then she came out with us. So one thing led to another, and um, I got involved in another HIV care engagement grant that led to me getting a faculty appointment. And then I made some additional connections and through some handshaking and um, women's health primary care, which is a UCSF health primary care practice run actually by the department of OBGYN, but staffed by primary care people housed at the women's health center uh, at Mount Zion agreed to bring me on and allow me to sort of embed uh, a transgender medicine program there and incubate it and grow it. And so that started in 2013. We launched right around this time in 2013. And this is this, you know, sort of well-wishing from the state Senator Leno at the time. And uh, that sort of brings us to, you know, where we are today. I won't get, you know, this is not a clinical group, so I won't get too much into the details, but fast forward now going on 11 years and, and we can certainly talk about it in the Q&A if people want to. Um, this is where we are now. We have a, a program website. We have a full range of services, hormone therapy, primary care. We have some limited behavioral health offerings. We have the full range of surgery and voice interventions with the exception of phalloplasty, which is creation of a penis using skin grafts, but that's coming soon. Um, and uh, we have thousands of patients have been treated and we have our own facility now. So we moved out of women's health in April of 2021 and we moved over to 1725 Montgomery Street, um, which is a satellite building that UCSF leases. And we have, we have a little space in there. We share it with radiology, as you might've seen in that first slide. So um, that is, that's kind of how I got here clinically. Um, and then I, I wanna now spend a little time talking about some more academic and research oriented kind of aspects of the work that I've done here. And, um, and then also um, uh, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer. So um, actually um, in the midst of all this, what I kind of left out was that I went to get a master's in public health. And that was because, um, and some of you may know this, especially those of you who aren't physicians who maybe have engaged with some, you know, sometimes physicians can get a little, we can be a cocky group. And, uh, you know, sometimes you see in like old movies, they'll be like um, the town, uh, the, the town uh, power plant and the town coal burner is not working. What should we do? And everybody's talking and they say, well, what does Doc Brown think? You know, people think that doctors and doctors too, I think, think they know everything. But 
um, it was emphasized to me that to really get into a more of a research and academic oriented career, I needed to have more than just medical school and residency. And I think there are lots and lots of different ways that physicians can sort of expand their um, ability to become a physician scientist. And that can include unstructured programs, like just um, being in a mentorship or relationship and getting involved in different academic programs. Um, as you can see, I tend to be a pretty DIY type of person. And so, you know, I don't know that I think that becoming a DIY researcher is super easy to do. And I think that um, it's probably best to at least get some kind of basic training. So I wound up, the first thing I did was I took a, um, I took a biostats class um, at, where did I do it? UC Berkeley Extension. And then I took another biostats class at UCSF. And then I took, after that, I took a, like an introduction to clinical research class at UCSF. And that, that was, that was good. And I feel like that really started to open my eyes to how things worked. And then I went and got a master's in public health, which I thought was um, incredibly helpful and has, um, for me, was a great degree training course of study because I gained a mix. Uh, it was a community health sciences oriented MPH. And I got a mix of sort of pure, pure research skills, as well as program development and evaluation. And then um, sort of epi biostats type pieces. And I also got a pretty decent amount of sort of administrative skills and like management and understanding the healthcare system. So I'm a big fan of MPH, of master's in public health degrees for people who are looking for kind of a broad range of, of skills to get out of it. And then I also went through a faculty leadership development program at UCSF um, that was more focused on becoming a leader and a physician leader. So, um, that's kind of how I got to where I am. So now what I'd like to do is, you know, for the remaining, you know, 20 minutes until we go to Q&A is um, excuse me, spend some time talking about some of the research um, work that I've done. And the last few years, I have gotten so busy in my administrative roles with the health system in the medical school that my engagement in sort of what you might consider to be pure research has become quite limited. So I'm not, I'm no longer like applying for a research grant, getting the grant and then executing the grant, writing the papers and the reports and then like applying for another grant. Um, I'm in my day-to-day -day life now, I'm doing more sort of quasi research, which I would call sort of program development and evaluation. And there's a great deal of richness in the data that's being generated and the, the eventual vision in some, some of these things is to publish them. But it's really more health services research oriented. And there aren't a lot of people in this country who are interested in funding health services research. So a lot of times these kinds of health services research initiatives are really piggybacked onto institutional quality improvement or operational aspects. And you'll see what I'm talking about here. So one of the main things, and I think that you mentioned this in my will in my introduction, one of the main areas of focus that I have in my work is in SOGI data, which is used to describe the term sexual orientation and gender identity data. And it's really a whole range of, of descriptors and measures, um, including sexual orientation. And your sexual orientation can be a few different things, right? It can be who you're attracted to. It can be the term that you use to describe yourself. It can be um, the organs of the people you have sex with or the kinds of sexual behaviors you engage in. And then your gender identity, you know, so let me back up on that. Typically, when we talk about sexual orientation in sort of like a data space, we're talking about like a term used to describe your sexuality or sexual orientation. So like lesbian or queer or pansexual or bisexual or something like that. And then um, your gender identity data really has four different measures. Your gender identity, the sex that was recorded at birth or some other measure that we'll talk about in a few minutes your pronouns and your chosen or lived name. Um, so, you know, this is, I mean, y'all probably know this already, but I'm putting this in here because I wanted to show you that when you are trying to convince people that it is important to measure who is and who is not a sexual or gender minority, there has to be a reason why. And so we have plenty of data showing that sexual and or gender minority groups experience health disparities so if you don't measure 
to find out who is and who isn't, you can't make comparison. You can't form a comparison in a control group to do any kind of research. So a lot of times in the old days, it's not really, people don't think this way anymore, but I mean, 15, 20 years ago, people were like, well, why don't we only ask our, you know, anybody who's trans will get their gender identity data from him, them. But it's like, well, how do you know who is trans and who isn't? So, um, you know, why do we need SOGI data? Well, let's say there's a primary care uh, service that wants to know if there's a disparity for flu vaccine by sexual orientation. The emergency department wants to know if the left without treatment rate, so somebody who checked in in the ER but then took off before being seen, is higher for trans people. The whole health system wants to know if sexual and gender minority population, uh, people who are in that population are more likely to be lost to follow up, meaning they, you know, the doctor said, come back and see me for three months so we can do some more tests and the person just disappeared. Um, the invest there's an investigator who wants to submit R01 data but they need preliminary data for the planned enrollment table and the NIH is gonna to wanna to know, well, do you have any trans people uh, or sexual minority people in your uh, enrollment population? You know, your, your plan is to enroll patients who are seen in clinics A, B, and C. How many trans and, and uh, sexual and gender minority people do you have access to? So that can actually create an upstream block to getting funding because if you submit the proposal without a, a detailed planned enrollment projection, then they might say that we can't fund this because we don't have any proof that they're going to be able to enroll those people. You know, also patients just want their providers to know important things about them. You know, patient doesn't want to be asked for the umpteenth time, you know, have they had, when was their last pap? And they're like, I wasn't born with a uterus, you know? Um, patient doesn't want to be asked for the umpteenth time, do you have a husband? No, I don't have a husband. You see, my sexual orientation is lesbian. So, you know, and also we just, it's just the right thing to do. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, that's like the last thing I list here because a lot of times in, when you're talking about funding and big institutions and policy and everything, you know, saying this is the right thing to do sometimes isn't enough. And you have to have additional proof like I'm showing you here in these slides. So there is a regulatory and policy landscape, you know, the California state law requires a range of departments and divisions to routinely collect SOGI data, but it has been found, and there was a recent audit conducted of the Department of Public Health that found that wholesale across the department, they're actually not meeting the goals of this AB 959, which mandated uh, collection of SOGI data from different programs. So it makes it really hard for California, all of these departments to do research and to do program planning and evaluation if they don't really know who the sexual and gender minorities are. So now there's some movement where lawmakers may need to kind of do some additional legislation to close some loopholes and really clean this up. So the thing is, is that even in a state like California, where there is a lot of legislative pressure and legal pressures to do this, we're still not doing a great job with collecting these data. At the federal level, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology has a set of standards called United States Core Data for Interoperability. And this regulates the ways that health, um, electronic health records access and share data between themselves and, and then with other database systems that you might use if you're a big data researcher, or, you know, you're doing population health work and you're using clinical databases to, to drive your work. So you can see here that, um, Various SOGI measures are included at the federal level as well. The HRSA, which uh, oversees all of the federally qualified health centers, which are safety net clinics, also requires uniform collection of SOGI data from, from their clinics. And then um, <clears throat> CDC recommends collecting the data. The UCLA Williams Institute, which is a big LGBT policy think tank, recommends it. And the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine also recommend it. So, and then there's good data to show that there are patient-centered considerations for doing this too, like using the wrong name, pronoun, or gender marker is common, erodes trust, and causes trauma. This is from a qualitative study. So, I mean, this is a lot of stuff that you all probably agree with and know and are not surprised to hear, but it is, it's, it's good to think about talking points because you do have to sell this stuff. And I'm going to talk a little in, in a couple of minutes about some research-specific considerations for this, for people who are doing pure research. So another thing that's really important, and this applies in clinical context or in a research population or any population, when I was in medical school in the 90s, they taught us that the way you take a sexual history was to ask this question, do you have sex with men, women, or both? And so it was basically today class, we're going to talk 
have a lecture on how to take a sexual history. You ask the patient, do you have a sex with men, women, or both? That concludes today's lecture on taking a sexual history. And so it's not ideal. It doesn't tell you all you need to know because it doesn't tell you anything about the kind of organs are involved, what's going where, what kind of risk behaviors. Sometimes you might be having sex only with women, but some of those women have penises. Do those women who have penises are able to make sperm or not? So there's lots of different considerations that come up. So this is in a, um, a perspectives piece that I wrote about administering PrEP to trans populations after we did a big study. Um, and then this was sort of a follow-up um, perspectives piece that I published after we published the main findings. And um, I like to think about it as like peeling an onion. You know, if you have to be able to take this history from everybody, including your sort of monolingual Tagalog only 75 year old patient or research participant. So you have to think of a way to ask these questions in a way that's going to make sense to everybody. And so, so what that means is that you can't just come out guns a blazing and be like, you know, with, with terminology that only community members would understand because you don't want to lose the non-community members because they're going to just leave the question blank. And then you're going to have a bunch of people who responded with, you know, I'm, you know, biromantic demisexual and a bunch of people who looked at all these choices and they're like, I don't even know what this question means. And they're going to skip it. So there has to be a sweet spot that we find when trying to collect these data in a way that, that either informs the, the respondent on what this stuff is all about, also takes into consideration that the person's cultural values or their time or linguistic issues may impair their ability to answer the question. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be getting highly granular and very sort of affirming range of responses to these questions. But, but I am saying that there has to be some very intentional thought about what happens to the you know, 90 plus percent of the human population who are not queer when they see that question, is it going to lead to them answering the question in a way that provides meaningful responses that you can then analyze down the line? Unfortunately, there hasn't been enough research in that area. There have been fleets and starts of research, but there hasn't really been soup to nuts efforts to really try to dig down and figure out what are the best ways to ask these questions to get the best responses from everybody and be as inclusive as possible. So, you know, I like to start, you know, are you a sexual person? Do you have a sexual orientation? I might define the term. Oh, how would you describe it? Um, do you have a term used to describe it? Are you sexually active? Some people are sexually active with more than one partner, even if they're married. Does that, you know, these are questions we ask everybody. Does that describe you? And so when you kind of diffuse the stigma, because you're going to have, again, you're going to have somebody, they're elderly, they're conservative, they have language limitations, they're not from here. And you're, they're going to be offended that you ask if they would have extramarital sex. So you might say, we have a set of questions that we ask everyone. They may not apply to you. And so if I may, I ask you a range of questions relating to your sexuality and your sexual behaviors. And then, and then, and then you can say, you know, these are questions we ask everyone, anyone. And then you kind of finally get down to the gender of your partner. Does your partner have a penis? Are there other organs involved? Gender of partner and organs of partner are different things. The gender of your partner will tell you um, what kind of experience does that person have when they walk down the street. So like if a, the patient is a woman and they have a female partner, then they may ex experience a social driver of health of depending on where they live or where they travel to or what their life is like, they may not feel comfortable holding hands in public or as heterosexual people do. And so that can lead to stressors or they may hold hands in public and then be subject to discrimination or um, attack or assault. And then the organs are different because organs tell you, are, is, there a, is there a sperm making organ connecting with the egg making organ that would inform a need for contraception or otherwise family planning discussions? Um, is there a, a flesh penis going into something? Cause that would have different HIV risk considerations. So these are all things to think about. So I actually did a study here at UCSF at Women's Health when I was embedded there, where we asked patients questions about how would they like to provide this information. And um, I don't, I'm not showing you some of the other data from the study, but we basically found out that everybody was happy to, there, was a, there were high levels of satisfaction with answering these questions across all populations. 
And I think that the reason the satisfaction was so high was because the mode that we used to ask the questions wasn't it was an iPad that they were given a check in. And the iPad kind of cycled them through the different questions. And it introduced a bias, I'm sure, but not surprisingly of the respondents, but there were some 250. 80% wanted to use an anonymous method to provide this information. And half of those 80% preferred to use an electronic, I mean, more than half, half of the respondents and like two thirds of the people of these 80% preferred to use an electronic device in the waiting room. And then another group would prefer to do it using like a patient portal, like a MyChart or something. And then a, a minority wanted to have a pen and paper form, which uh, you know, uh, people I'm talking to here are probably in various stages of your career, but my kid is almost seven. If they become a doctor, then maybe by the time they are like late career, you can stop using pen and paper forms, but it's going to need to take until like the early Gen Xers are dead before you can stop using pen and paper. Cause they're all, most of many of the boomers and some, even some early Gen Xers are not like universally great with technology devices. So, um, but what you can see here, what's really important is that the remaining 20% either wanted their medical provider to ask it or basically didn't want to be asked. But people don't want to get asked these questions live and verbally by a busy nurse or a registration staff in the kind of in passing in these sort of non-intimate contexts. In a research context, when you're gathering this data, I think if you have somebody who's sitting in a quiet room and they're taking a, a research intake with a patient, with a participant, I think that that would be more reasonable. But if you have a situation where you're just kind of like quickly screening people for research eligibility or something like that, it, it might be something to think about. You know, is this a context in which to ask the person directly to their face about these sensitive questions? So what I wanted to show you here is, is um, th this is kind of the, the logic that we used in that study to determine who is trans. And you saw that I said earlier that there was like, you asked the gender identity and then you asked the birth sex. But actually th there is pushback against asking somebody their birth assigned sex. There's a stigma attached to it. There's not a lot of consensus about what language to use. Like were you designated female at birth, assigned female at birth, were you recorded as female at birth? So um, the model, the, the rubric that I used for this study, which I'm a big fan of, is you ask the gender, and then if their gender is male or female, then they get a skip, a, a skip pattern in the iPad comes up and says, are you trans, you know, or any of these terms? And if they say no, or I don't understand the question, then you make the determination that that patient is not trans. And that's the end of the gender identity questions. If they answer, if they answer female or male and they answer yes to this question, then they're trans. And then you might ask, or you might not ask what sex is listed on your original birth certificate. And then that's the end of the gender identity questions. If you don't ask what gender is listed on sex on their birth certificate, you're, you may find out that this, you'll never find out if this non-binary person is sort of a masculine spectrum or feminine spectrum. And there can be different issues because if you're studying cervical cancer, you want to know if that person had a uterus at birth or not. So these are some other things to think about. And there might, you know, the language that we used here was what sex is listed on your original birth certificate, trying to be as, as destigmatizing as possible, not like assigned or designated, but just like, what did they write down in the box? And this, this allows you to skip and skip confusing anybody who might not understand this or might be offended. You know, if somebody sees this question and they're offended, they're going to be like, no, absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's sad that people would be offended by the question, but there's an easy out. You just say no. And if they say something else, they're clearly not cis because they're not male or female. So then you just say the patient is trans and then they get the additional gender identity options. There's a whole breakout that they would get to choose of what their different options are. But the point is, is that this rubric filters out cis people before they get the whole bunch of options so they don't get overwhelmed. And then for um, sexual orientation, um, we we break out something else. This line should be going here. I think something happened in the formatting uh, when I moved the slide from one presentation to another. So if you're something else, then you have all of these additional questions. So we're not flooding people out front with a million choices, which they may just make them gloss over, especially if they don't get it. But we have this breakout. And um, you know the, the thing is that um, you can then kind of have as many 
you know, options as you want. And another thing I wanted to point out is that we use something else. I don't like other because it's an other, you're literally othering the person. So I tend, we tend to use like something else or option not listed here, you know, fill in sort of other, other ways to word it. I like something else. So where are we now? We have a smart form in the electronic health record. There are data elements on the back end. So for those of you who use the, the health, the um, patient database at UCSF as part of your research, these data elements all exist. We're currently in the process. Uh, this is these are signs that we have a check in to notify to update your pronoun because there's a glitch. You can't. It's hard to update the pronoun yourself online. Um, and so we're actually in the process of preparing to pilot implementing this in a range of different contexts. So I, I'm going to skip this because from the interest of time, I want to leave time for Q and A. I see a bunch of things are popping up. So some of this stuff is a little in the weeds. I put it in here in case like nobody seemed interested. And then um, we can always come back to it. But basically there's a lot of stuff you have to do to make this happen. All these work groups and committees and task forces. It's very complicated. Um, I'm gonna skip this too. I'm gonna skip this too, cause I wanna leave time for questions and we can always come back to it. I'm gonna skip all this cause I don't, I think it's just less important. And then um, this is gonna be, this is a, like, sort of the last, the pivot now, new area of, of interest of mine and, and research. And let's let's pivot, and then we'll go to Q and A. So, but this is a sort of a quickie. Um, a sixty-six year old trans woman with a history of brain injury and cognitive impairment, anxiety, depression, and PTSD, who's confused and sometimes confabulates. She's got limited memory. She lives alone in a single room occupancy. She doesn't have any social support. She has some friends, but doesn't know who they are. And she's looking to get breast augmentation. So she's legitimately trans, you know, she really, this patient really, you know, has gender dysphoria, you know, there's, there's, I, I want to move away from any kind of like, oh, is she really trans or not um, discussion, because she's, she's trans, and we're going to, you know, she's, somebody has evaluated her and who knows how to identify gender dysphoria and has determined that the patient has gender dysphoria. So, um, you know, historically, patients had to get a letter written that said that they're really trans, and they have the capacity to consent to gender affirming interventions. And that was required by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. They're often called like a WPATH letter. And, um, but the problem is, is that that letter really lacked any guidance on how to deal with patients who have any psychosocial needs. It didn't involve screening for psychosocial needs. So basically what you had is you had these patients who would go and get somebody to write them a letter saying they're really trans and they have the capacity to provide consent and they would show up for, to see the surgeon. And it turns out the patient is substance using or has no social support is homeless or has limited, you know, kind of housing limitations. And then it would create this sort of uh, gatekeeping model where patients would show up with a letter saying, I'm really trans, you have to do surgery on me tomorrow, you know, as soon as possible. And if the surgeon gave any pushback about any issues that really face anybody going for surgery, like a transplant or a, um, a joint replacement, you would undergo the same kind of evaluation. So it creates this sort of gatekeeping model it encourages patients to kind of gain you know I, you know i put game the system in quotes because that's what people call it it's not like in a stigma -y kind of way but encourage patients to just not disclose that they're currently living on their friend's couch and just to base and we don't we want to find out that you're living on your friend's couch so we can help find you a place to stay that's more appropriate so um i developed this uh navigation workflow i published this this was my mph thesis and um i published this and and now we're implementing it here. And at some point, I'm hoping to actually publish some, some data that I'm collecting relating to this. But you basically, before doing their kind of like, is this person really trans assessment, you do this sort of, what sort of functional assistance does this patient need? And then while they're waiting for surgery, you provide them with the needed education and resources while also conducting reassessments. And then as they're right before their surgery phase, you conduct a recovery, you, you make sure that they have a recovery location, somebody to take them to and from surgery and someone to be with them like in the immediate post-op phase. And then they get some ongoing post-op reassessments and check-ins and then eventually the surgical phase ends. And also in here is you wanna make sure that the patient has realistic expectations for the surgery. If the patient thinks that the surgery is gonna go great, it's gonna solve all their world's problems and there's no possibility of complication, that patient does not have realistic expectations and they're going to be disappointed. So we've actually implemented uh, a process here. I, I got UCSF to hire a social worker and then we actually, we stratify patients and um, sometimes it, 
it's because it's a busy clinical environment. We're not always formally assigning levels of intensity to different patients, but that's the framework that we use. And we have sort of higher risk and then intermediate risk and lower risk patients based on various aspects. And then depending on the risk that they're assessed at the beginning, that then sort of an intervention and monitoring plan is developed over time. And um, so um, this is something that I have some data that I need to work on. The problem has been, and some of you may deal with this at UCSF too, is that um, IT takes forever to get reports created and other sort of things. So I'm kind of stuck in report wait mode right now. The last thing I wanted to just mention before we go to Q&A is that I am one of the Differences Matter directors and I have a bunch of different things that are going on that are somewhat more structured. Uh, I'm one of the co-directors for the Innovate Collection and Use of Data for Equity section. And uh, this is a School of Medicine initiative, Differences Matter. And we are basically scouring the campus and the medical school and, you know, as well as the health system to identify places where we can do a better job at collecting data to use it to leverage equity related work. And we actually have some recommendations that we're trying to get incorporated into the IRB review process. And we also are going to be having in the coming months a um, sort of like a high level user's guide on what equity related variables to measure. And you hear me talking about equity related variables, on ERVs we call them. And this is also work that I do with the health system with the Department of um, that the health equity division, I should say, which is part of the Department of Quality and Safety. We actually have a funding grant from PCORI right now to develop capacity within UCSF Health um, to do much better in the way we collect all equity related variables, which include SOGI as well as race, ethnicity, and language, which we call real data. And then we're really adding a D on there to real for disability um, or ability. So real, uh, we haven't figured out what the acronym is going to be yet but we're developing instruments to collect this at the clinical point of care and then have data structures where it can be stored. And then researchers can then go in and have all this data available. So one of the things that we're going to be doing in the coming months is actually piloting some of the SOGI functionality that I've glazed over here at, uh, in several different clinic contexts as a deliverable for our Cori capacity building grant. And then we, the plan would be to use that model uh, that lessons learned from that pilot and use that as sort of a demonstration project for a broader launch of not just SOGI, but all equity related variables. So hopefully I haven't lost you too much. Um, what I'm going to do, I'll stop sharing my screen. And then if we run out of questions, I can go back and talk a little bit more detail about some of these things that came up at the end. Um, okay, here. So we've got three questions. Do you have any advice for trans identifying healthcare students? who want to do trans advocacy and education work in historically cishet dominated spaces? Wow, that is a great question. Uh, it is sort of like a $64,000 question. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a sprawling, it's a great question. I'm trying to think about how could I answer that. Um, it's kind of a general question. I think that, I, I think the first thing that I recommend since you're, telling me that you're a trans identifying healthcare student um, would be to, to focus on your education and get your education sorted out. Because if you, uh, it's, it's hard being a trans person in the world and it's hard being a trans person in med school. And, you know, if don't get too roped in to, to take care of yourself. You know, it's a, there's a lot of windmills to fight in this work. The, the, the best thing that you can do to be an advocate is to become a physician or become an NP, whatever, pro, you know, dentist, whatever program you're in and, and, and then get out there and do the work. So first take care of yourself, get your degree, get settled in, learn what you need to learn. And then, and then you can start doing the work. And I will tell you that it is hard. And so you have to set boundaries because you're going to be in meetings where you're the only trans person. You're going to be in meetings where you're the only queer person and you're going to feel overwhelmed. And so you have to balance it with other stuff. You know, I'm sometimes I just like being a part of my job as a medical director and I'm just looking at like productivity numbers and schedules 
And I'm like, this is great. There's just nothing controversial about this. And then when I work in the ER, the same thing, I'm just like a grunt ER doc, just moving them through. And it has nothing to do with any of this. And it's very, it's a nice recharge. So I think take care of yourself, get your degree, and then figure out what is it that you want to do and try to identify things that are movable objects that you can push along. Um, do you have any advice for trans identifying healthcare students? Oh, wait a minute. Did I just, hold on. I might have, what did I do here? Uh, okay, all right, uh, done, here we go. So next one, are there any privacy concerns regarding SOGI data as many states are becoming more hostile towards the trans population? Yes, there are. And there actually is a committee at UCSF that is looking at uh, sort of taking steps about sensitive data and, we, and how to protect people from having that data disclosed to places where you don't want it disclosed. It's a very hot topic. Um, I don't really know what to do about it. The data geek in me, who is also queer and trans, is I don't feel ready to say we should not collect this data because you can it can be used to sort of round people up. I don't think that we're at that level yet. I'm not practicing in Alabama though. Um, it is definitely something to be concerned about. And like I said, there is a sensitive, I forget what they're called. There's like a work group that's forming. I'm peripherally involved with it of sensitive data. It's focused around family planning and, and um, abortion care aspects too, um, but that is evolving. Um, is there additional training that students at UCSF can take to learn more about the needs of the queer community? You know, I wish I could tell you um, that there is a very specific, um, you know, program. Uh, what I would recommend that you do is check with the LGBTQ Resource Center, um, which is run by the Office of Diversity and Outreach, and see what kind of resources and tools they have. There definitely is, there definitely are efforts to get more sort of queer health stuff incorporated into the medical school curriculum. Um, there are conferences that come up. So one conference that is probably really good for people who are learners is GLMA. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but GLMA, it used to stand for Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, but kind of like when FedEx stopped being Federal Express, um, they changed their name to GLMA and it's like LGBTQ health advocates or something is a tagline. So, so the fact that it's originally stood for Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, they don't they don't do that anymore, but they kept the legacy name. You know, these are decisions that are made. So, but in any case, GLMA does annual conferences that are sort of these. They're not diving too. It's not like a heavily data driven conference, and it's I think it's at like it's good for like a learner level. There's a lot of like networking that goes on at those conferences, and it's an opportunity to meet a lot of people who are doing this work. And there is some hard academic stuff that goes on at those conferences too. But so that's something I'd look into. There's going to be a trans health summit in the spring of 25 that is run at UCSF. And then I run as sort of a concurrent, more provider oriented CME type activity as well. So keep your eyes out for that. And then the last question, what is the next frontier for clinical research in transgender healthcare? It's a great question. The answer would basically be everything. Um, we have a real lack of research in pretty much every area. Um, we need research on outcomes related to hormone therapy in the long term. We also need comparative studies research, comparative effectiveness research to look at different approaches to hormone therapy, dosing, routes, etc. And then we also need research to look at surgical uh, context to see are there different surgical approaches that have different outcomes or risks. We need more research on fertility and reproduction. And we also need more research on outcomes related to trans youth, in particular um, approaches to assessing trans youth as uh, preparedness to undergo medical and surgical transition, and also looking at outcomes related to the various medical interventions, especially around things like um, cognitive development, bone development, and uh, fertility as well. So lots and lots of stuff there. If you're interested in it, you have a lot of opportunity. The real question is finding the funding sources for that. So um, looks like that empties the question. It looks like 
where we've got I have a follow up question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. If Will. that's all right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so regarding Soji data, um, how do you think asking for this data um, changes when the person asking is a healthcare provider versus an employer or an HR professional? Is there a case where this is appropriate versus inappropriate? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't have a great answer because uh, that's a little bit, that's getting a little bit of field of my expertise. That's really a question for sort of like a, someone with a policy eye, a legal eye, and a sort of human resources eye. Um, you know, most of what I do is in the healthcare and health space where there are specific protections and requirements about security of that data. If you disclose to an employer something about your sexuality or, or your gender, I don't know how private that is. And there are 20 some odd states where you're allowed to fire somebody because they're trans, or you can, you can discriminate against them from hiring them because they're trans. So you walk in, you do your whole interview. I'd love to offer you this job. Oh, also I'm transgender. Ah, we do not hire transgender people here. And it's legal to do that. They can, they can offer you the job and find out you're trans and they could, you know, I mean, there would be a court case and they have to go through a rigmarole, but so that would be something that I don't have a great answer for, but it is a good question. And those are some of the factors to think about. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, I guess, so with your experience working in the emergency department, um, what policies do you think can help make the experience of receiving emergency care easier for patients who identify as trans? Yeah. So I think one of the most important things, and this is, I'm dealing with this today, actually, there's an email exchange that I'm involved with that has to do with wristbands for admitted patients. So emergency department or inpatient, you know, a lot of times those patients are, it's a much more chaotic and less personal context than ambulatory, than clinic care. And so, you know, the wristbands really need to show the pronoun and not the legal sex. And, um, so I think that that's an important thing. There are a ton of regulatory and like safety things that bump up against that. So you have to kind of figure out how to navigate through all of that. Um, another thing that really needs to be explored and sorted out in an emergency medicine context is how to deal with collecting SOGI data and using SOGI data in the context of patient care or interactions when you have a patient who comes in who's unconscious, nonverbal, or you have a minor situation where the, you know, the, and it's possible maybe that the minor like disclosed their SOGI data, but didn't realize that that SOGI data would then go into their chart in a place where their parents would see it. Um, so there's still a lot of stuff that has to be kind of sorted out and fine tuned with that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very sensitive information. Um, I think that's unfortunately our time. Uh, so thank you again so much, Dr. Joy Deutsch for joining us today. Um, if you have questions uh, that we didn't have time for, Dr. Deutsch has graciously agreed to answer questions. So please reach out if you would like. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for attending and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.